dame, come. Oh, thank you, sir. I buy for my wedding on Sunday. What a pity I shan't be here. Never mind, I shall be thinking about you all. You'll be thinking of a very lucky fellow. Huh? Henriette? Ma petite? Take her future mother in law. Henriette has run away with a young man. What young man? The young man who arrived in the car at lunchtime yesterday. But she didn't just meet him. That's nonsense. They must have been going together for weeks. That's what I believe, Mr. Sterling. But I saw him when he came in and I was having my lunch. I'm quite certain they never met before. Then you must have been fooled as much as we were. I don't think so. You see, to me, it's quite understandable. To run away with someone she's only met for 24 hours. And three days before she was going to... You marry a man twice her age. And a widower with two children. Why? Because she loved him, I hope. He loved her, undoubtedly. But to yet, I think he merely represented security. Then quite suddenly this young man arrived. From the very first moment the mutual attraction was terrific. I saw it all. Last night, let us presume, he kissed her. And from that moment, she was so drawn to her young man, both mentally and physically, that within 24 hours, she'd packed her bag and gone. I don't believe any woman could meet a complete stranger and fall in love with him in five minutes. I just don't believe it. But it happened. Only had said so in her note. Having met the young man, she was... Not accountable for her action. A fine thing if we all did things like that and said we weren't responsible. You've got some cigar ash on your coat, dear. I seem to be playing defending counsel. If I am, it's because I've seen this happen before. You mean a girl run away with a complete stranger? I mean a woman fall in love with a complete stranger. Well, I for one don't believe it. Just a moment. Let's hear what Mr. Sterling has to say. All right, I'll tell you the story. Oh. But on one condition. Yes? That when I've finished, you reconsider your verdict on poor Arliers. That's all right. I'd like to hear the story. Keep an open mind. This particular incident happened before the war. If I give you names, they're, of course, fictitious. Oh, naturally. Well, I just bought the Val Rosa. And I was based that summer on Monte Carlo. Ooh. I had friends staying with me on board. On this particular morning, we were lying offshore opposite the casino. The sun was shining and the Mediterranean was its bluest. My guests were swimming and sunbathing. In fact, they were making the most of a perfect day. I had staying with me a young cousin of mine, Peter Sterling, 
When I say he was staying with me, I hadn't invited him, but he was the type of young man who always turned up when I didn't really want him. Not that I didn't like him, but he disturbed my work, always playing a gramophone and inviting complete strangers on board. In fact, I found him just a little trying. Then there were Alice and Frank Brown, a couple of good-looking Americans from California. Frank directed a picture of one of my novels, and I'd stayed with them in Hollywood. So theirs was a return visit to me. But neither Peter nor the Browns are very important to this tale. They just happened to be there. My fourth guest was more interesting. A woman named... named... Linda Venny. Linda's husband had been a great friend of mine. In fact, I was best man at their wedding. He was head of his father's business. And the only thing that might have marred a perfect marriage was the fact that they had no children. But she was the center of her own small community. And although one might say she led a very sheltered existence, her days were always full of some activity. Hospitals, committees, work of various kinds on behalf of other people. And then she lost her husband. He was killed in a motoring accident. I continued to see quite a lot of her whenever I was in England. In fact, I was administrator of her estate under her husband's will. Thank you. Enjoying it, sir? Loving every minute of it. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. There they are, standing in the row. I haven't seen you so gay for a long time. I'm glad now I came. That's good enough reason for having asked you. What have you done with Peter? Oh, he's around somewhere. He wanted to give me a swimming lesson. Do you really mean that? Of course I do. What did you expect me to say? I must be losing my grip. As far as I'm concerned, you never really had one. Am I being too unkind? Absolutely brutal. Do you know I can't sleep at night? Nonsense. I heard you snoring like a grampus. That was pure absent-mindedness. <laughs> Poor Peter. Never mind. Don't let it spoil your holiday. You'll find some lovely, sympathetic girl here in Monte Carlo who'll understand you. Not quite as I do, perhaps, but uh, in a way you want to be understood. And then you won't feel you're losing your grip, will you? I'm just a simple chap who wants to be loved. A child of nature, that's all. Nature gets blamed for an awful lot of things, doesn't she? No, yeah, thank you. Are you coming to the casino tonight? I don't gamble. You don't gamble, you don't drink, you don't champagne, sir? No, oh, thank you. I drink to your cold heart, my dear Linda. And to the hope that perhaps someday it may become warm again. Why don't you change your mind and come to the casino? No, thanks. I'll stay with Linda, if she can bear it. Okay, but you'll have to bail me out if I go broke. See you later. Well, I'm going to look for that lovely, sympathetic woman who'll understand me. Good luck. And I hope nobody warns her you're coming. And you've never seen it before. Let me. Thanks. Have you never gambled in your life? No. You know, Francis and I always took our holidays in Scotland, shooting or fishing. We never went abroad. I've really led a very quiet existence. You'd probably call it a tame one, lacking all excitement. Why should I criticize your love? You've achieved something that very few people have. Peace and happiness. Okay. I live in a backwater, I suppose. Still, it's a very pleasant backwater. I don't think I want anything else. That's why I thought twice about accepting your invitation. I didn't think I'd like Monte Carlo. I'm not sure that I do. Sir, some more coffee. Right, sir. All I hear revolves around that casino. The spin of the croupier's wheel dictates the lives of the entire principality. I didn't know you gambled. No, I don't. 
not a lot. But I love watching the people who do. They're over professional gamblers, usually members of a syndicate. Or the old women, taking a few francs, trying to win the rent of a garret in Nice. It's the drama, the excitement. I find it stimulates the imagination. That's why I go. I can feel your fingers twitching. You want to go now, don't you? I think you should go once while you're here. Yes, I think I should too. Will you take me? I should be charmed, my dear Mrs. Fenton. Robert, I'd like to introduce a very good friend of mine, Mademoiselle... Uh, what was your name again? Geeker. Oh, Geeker, of course, yeah. How do you do? Hello. <clears throat> Just a simple child of nature. For the last couple of days, I thought he'd been losing his crew. Oh, not Peter. He'll always have a tight grip on something. But not on you, I'm thankful to say. I understand now why you said you like to watch them. Look at those faces. Don't look at their faces. Look at their hands. Gamblers learn to control their faces. But their hands blab secrets shamelessly. Look at those hands. Placing their sticks. Each one of them like a beast of prey. Some of them gnarled and old. Some of them covered with rings and bracelets. Some of them hairy like the paws of wild animals. Some of them like writhing eels. Quite fascinating. A claw-like hand, that's avarice. A loose hand, that's extravagance. A quiet one, calculation. A trembling one, despair. All of them tense, impatient. Now look at the hands of the croupier. They are pure automaton. They do their work as though it were a business with non-committal precision. Mechanical as a calculating machine. Now look at the hands of the winners. Look at them. Caressing those plucks as though they were a heap of jewels. You'll get to know each pair of hands as if they were your own. Aren't you going to play? No. Perhaps I will if you don't mind. I play Shelley. Would you like to come with me? No, I prefer to watch the roulette. But you go, please.
Bien, nous avons plus.
just want you to come away. Good evening, madame. I have given you an address. Look, I want you to take this money. Get a room here for the night. Tomorrow you can go back to Nice. Don't waste your money on me. I was watching you in the casino. I knew that you'd lost everything. There's no disgrace in accepting help. I don't care whether I sleep tonight or not. Oh, don't talk such dramatic nonsense. You're young. For heaven's sake, face up to life. When you wake up tomorrow, you'll think differently about the whole thing. Here again. Since the day you were born. Have you ever been tempted to do something really wrong? 
Have you ever known what it is to have a devil living deep down inside of you? You don't know the first thing about life. Come on, you go. Where's your husband? My husband is dead. Oh. I may know nothing about your life, but I've come back here tonight to try and save it. Why? Because you're so alone. You never said a truer word. Oh, oh, don't. Please don't be so unhappy. I'm with you. you've dipped your ladylike fingers into. I was born in Ireland, where my father owned a racing stable. At the age of six, I was saving pennies to back horses for the local bookmaker. Then when I came to England to school, I stopped backing horses and taught the other kids how to play poker. I used to win. At Oxford, I got in with the racing set again, and I lost a packet. More than I could ask my father for, so I was sent down. My old man put me into his business in Dublin, providing I promised never to gamble again. So for five years, I neither touched a card nor made a bet. I thought I'd got the devil out of my system. As a reward, my father sent me to France to stay with my uncle in Paris. He had a business there. One afternoon, we all went to Longshore. They didn't realize that, to me, gambling was a disease. A disease which had lain dormant like a cancer for five long years. I knew nothing about form, but luck was with me. That day and the next, and the next after, I won a packet. But I didn't really find what was to give me complete and utter satisfaction till I walked through the glass doors of the casino at Deauville. The sight of the green bays, the scented atmosphere of the rooms made me drunk, reeling drunk. I was mad to gamble. I can remember my fingers twitching as I picked up the plaques from the cashier's desk and sat down like a drunken man and played. For five nights in succession, I won. Someone advised me to quit, but it was like asking a drug addict to give up dope. I couldn't quit. On the sixth night, I had my return ticket to Paris. That was all. I found that my uncle had been called to London. My aunt had gone with him. So I was alone in an apartment without a sou in my pocket. But luck was with me this time. A few weeks before, my aunt had asked me to get something from the safe. I knew where she kept the key. So I hoped 
opened it and borrowed a pair of diamond earrings. You mean you stole them? Call it what you like. But if I'd won last night, I'd have gone back to the pawnbroker and nobody would have been any the wiser. I told you you were dipping your fingers into a mud pie. I followed you last night because I wanted to help you. But you seem to be beyond help. If you'd known anything, you'd have recognized that fact in the first place. I'm through and I've got the sense to know it. You're only delaying the end of the story. I made a mistake. I see that now. What I did last night, I did from my heart, not from my head. It was stupid of me. Nice work. Well, now I'll write a letter. I can't just go out without saying goodbye. And I'll say goodbye too. I won't delay you any longer. Okay. What did he say? We're at the top. Oh.
right, Walter. All right. Comme vous voulez, madame. Please be seated. I've come to apologize. We didn't mean to disturb you. But you did disturb me. And I'm very happy. You see, there is a fish being cooked. It's the fish of the country. It's delicious. It will soon be ready. If you had not disturbed me, I should have gone on playing. The fish would have been spoiled. It would have been a tragedy. <laughs> then perhaps it's just as well we did disturb you. Good day, Father. Good day, my son. Uh, may I inquire how you and your wife came to visit us in our small village? Oh, quite by chance. No, oh, quite by chance. Smell. Delicious. Then you and your husband must come and share it with me. Oh, no, we can't. Come we can't do that. We Tu t'es encore bien débrouillé aujourd'hui, Frontin, hein? Tu sais où trouver son déjeuner, comme d'habitude. This is my mother. Madame? Please be seated. Monsieur? How do you do? My mother speaks no English. She's 72 next month. She will tell you she's a good cook, but don't believe her. Je viens de leur dire que tu ne sais pas l'anglais. Que tu te figurais une bonne cuisinière, mais qui ne doit pas le croire. Tu n'es qu'un gosse. Tu n'y connais rien à la cuisine. Et si ce n'était pas pour moi, tu serais mort de faim il y a déjà longtemps. Alors. Je sais que je suis only a small boy who knows nothing about cooking. If it were not for her, I'd starve to death. <laughs> Benedicas, Benedicas, par Jésus Christum Dominum Nostrum. Uh, this is uh, the fish in the stream. What fly do you use? A fly? No, I use a net. You see, you fish pull a spore, but I assassinate the fish. <laughs> I heard your piano concerto when it was played last month at the Albert Hall, Father. Qu'est-ce qu'elle a dit, madame? Qu'elle a entendu mon concerto le mois dernier à Londres. À son piano, son machin. My mother is not enamored of the musical side of my life. She's a harsh critic. And you like music too? Yes, do you? Why, yes, very much. But it has to have a melody. I can't take some of the noises that pass for modern music. Eh, hey, maestro, et le jeune homme, il n'a pas faim? Oh, I talk of music, you see what happens. Pardon, my son. And when do you two return to London? Um, I don't know. Perhaps we won't be going back to London. tellement heureuse que vous le portiez le jour de votre mariage avec monsieur. Vous êtes trop gentil. Comment saviez-vous? Mon fils se vit dans un monde à part, le monde de l'esprit. Mais moi, je comprends les amoureux. Je 
voulu que madame emporte un peu de la vincelle du pays. My mother thinks she is the best lace maker in the country, but I'm not so sure. Well, I am. I'm afraid it's getting late. I think we'd better be going. I should like to ask for a ride to Monte Carlo. My friend Labi Dominique is sick. Oh, with pleasure, Father. Au revoir, madame. Au revoir, mon fils. Madame, monsieur. Alors, François, tu as bien mangé, hein? Oh, C'était encore meilleur que la semaine dernière. I won't be there. It was like a dream. We really believed it for a moment. We didn't like to spoil it. We French are very practical people. We have a saying, Les rêves sont très agréables, mais il faut parfois se réveiller. Dreams are all very well, but one has to wake up. Your mother's very clever, isn't she, Father? She can't understand a word of English, yet all the time she knew we weren't married. She said that you lived in the world of the spirit, but that she knew people in love. She likes to think that, but she's not the only one who knows about love. I won't be five minutes. It was my pleasure. I have a decision to make. This is the moment to make it. I can't marry him. It would be wrong for us to be together. It could never make him happy. His happiness and success come first. goodbye to him. But I find it very, very difficult. I want a ticket to Paris for the 5.30 train. Oui, monsieur. Oh, you better make it second class. Where is she? Come. I don't know where she lives. Did she tell you? No. But she lent me money. Someday I've got to pay her back. She spoke about that. She does not want you to repay her. If from now on your life is the better for having known her, then she says she's well repaid. Go to Paris, my son. Make your peace with your own conscience. I think you've been very fortunate to have known her. Oh, Bill. Sir? Is Mrs. Fenning aboard? Yes, sir. She came in ten minutes ago. I didn't see her come back. 
You're probably thinking about all those devils and things that you're writing about, sir. How on earth do you know what I'm writing about? Well, one of your papers blew down in the galley last night, sir, and I read it before bringing it back. Gave me the creeps. Linda? Now I can? Please do. Guess check cash all right? Yes, thank you. The manager looked faintly surprised at the size of it. Are you sure this man will pay you back? He won't find me, so he can't pay me back. Dear Linda, that sort of philanthropy is absurd. I have no regrets. I blame myself. I took you to the casino, and within 24 hours, you got yourself involved in a desperate love affair with a complete stranger and lost 2,000 pounds. Today has been one of the happiest of my whole life. Don't spoil it now. I can't let you do this. He's got to pay you back. Where is he now? I don't know, but he's catching the 530 train for Paris. Look, would you mind if I went to the station? If you can describe him, I describe no. him. I... No, please don't interfere. I know exactly what I'm doing. You must love him very much. Then why aren't you going to see him again? Because I can't help him anymore. And if I married him, it just wouldn't work out. Are you sure? We have the same interest. In every way, it would be a mistake. I have enough sense left to realize that. He's taken a new hold on life. I, perhaps, have helped give him back his own spirit. For me, that is repayment enough. Please tell him. Perhaps you're right. For my part, I can only say I'm glad. Considerably without you, the party would be a complete failure. You're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're... You've been crying. Yes, I have. Do you want to tell me about it? No. You run along. Well, come with me. It'll do you good. I'll be up in a minute. Couldn't resist my charm. <laughs> What's she been crying about? I wonder what a talent you have for asking the wrong question. <laughs> I'm sorry he dragged you up on deck. Take a care. 
cab, you can just make it. What about your things? Send them to Paris, please. I'll pick them up at the Garde Lyon. I'm sorry, Robert. Bless you. Good luck. We'll leave tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. May I make your reservation? No, thank you. He's gone to Paris. Oh, quel dommage.
in love with a man or was it just an infatuation? I haven't the slightest doubt that she loved him ecstatically. I don't believe it. If she really loved him, even after suffering this degrading experience, she would have gone back to him. But she did, a short time afterward. She was too late. He'd already killed himself. And the girl? What about her? Did she get over it? Is she happy now? Who can say who is happy? But I think she is. My friend, I would like you to drink to the happiness of my Henriette. <laughs> to Henriette. To Henriette. Here I am. I miss you, darling, every minute. May I introduce you to my wife? Bonnie, dear. This is Mr. and Mrs. Barry. How do you do? They're on their honeymoon. This is Mrs. Ray. How do you do? Mr. Ray. Why, they're from Missouri. Mr. Madoc. Sure. Johnson. This is our good friend and patron, Monsieur Blanc. Enchanté, madame. 